You're listening to Depth Perception, supported by our patrons on Patreon. Hello, darling listeners. First, uh, do go check out our Patreon after the show. There you're going to find everything from show notes to audio extras to art and music uh, writing that Randy and I have done over the course of each month. Today's episode is going to be about Bong Joon-ho's 2019 film, Parasite. This is a film that I love, that I th- the film that Randy loves too, that we both love. There's a lot in this movie to talk about. It's rich with themes, dotted with symbols that sort of that tend to connect across the film's time and space. Very well written, very realistic family dynamics, uh, just beautiful acting, but also big questions. I think the biggest of which being, what is the parasite in this film? We'll try to answer that during this conversation. We had a lot to say. It was a fun conversation. We hope you enjoy. But just real quick before uh, you go in, we're going to be talking about the following sensitive subjects. Uh, at some point, you're going to hear rape mentioned. You're going to hear mentions of murder. You're going to you're going to hear us allude to uh, domestic violence also in our discussion of this film. Now you know. You can decide whether or not you want to listen. If you do, enjoy the show. Parasite by Bong Joon-ho. Yeah, his, what, 2019 film? Best picture, extremely well-regarded movie. The premise of this movie is that a family in poverty uh, makes for themselves an opportunity with the help of a friend of their son who I can only refer to as Kevin because that's what the movie calls him almost the whole time. I don't actually know his name. Mm-hmm. Uh, his, his friend goes away to college enlists Kevin to tutor the daughter of this rich family the park family in english and uh when when the when he sees how well it pays he then enlists his sister who then enlists their father who then enlists their mother into uh into employment with the park family where it gets interesting is what they have to do in order to get their entire family working in this house and what they do when uh when their entire family is working in the house Yes. A lot of things happen to them. What would you want to talk do you want to mention before we go into it the sort of the um what what, what is it the trigger of all of the other events in the movie? There's a meeting between um who we know is Kevin and again I also can't remember his Korean name right now. Um Kevin and his friend Min um Min gives Kevin a job that he previously had cuz he has to go abroad in college. It's it's a job tutoring the daughter in a rich family. He also gives the Kim family um, this stone. He has this um, friend, man, who gives him this stone. Um, it's supposed to bring wealth, I believe, prosperity, luck. Um, and then he leaves, and Kim Woo has um, like a fake college degree with him. He goes to the house. He interviews on recommendation from Min. Mrs. Park is impressed with him. She says, of course, it's not fully true, but she says, you know, the degree doesn't matter. No paperwork doesn't matter. It's the recommendation that matters. Um, And uh, then he gets the job. He's in. With a little bit of deception, he makes himself out to be a very, um, I don't know. He basically does like a, like a movie pers- like a uh imitation of like a like a tutor you know and it really impresses mrs park and there she basically is eating out of his hand that's how he gets his sister in yeah part of the part of the thing that about this movie that uh i want to make sure we touch on is that every member of the family is entirely qualified for the positions they fit themselves into uh kiwu is perfectly capable of tutoring english um 
Kijun, uh, Kijun, uh, Jessica, perfectly capable of teaching art. She's the movie tells us and shows us that she's an, a very capable artist. She makes up the therapy stuff. She says as much, but she definitely can teach the art. Uh, the father, um, Kite, uh, Kite is a great driver. The movie comments on his ability to take corners. And, uh, I, well, I don't know. I, I guess that, I guess that premise doesn't hold up quite so much considering that the, um, the mother of the family, she can't cook. It seems like it was just broth. It seems like it was just ramen. She couldn't make ramen. Although I know I, if it wasn't ramen now. I was thinking that because it was called Ramdan, but... It, it is like, I actually looked into this. Basically, Bong Joon-ho, when he was writing the script for this film, he made this soup up. It's based on like a mixture of, um, I think, black bean flavored and seafood flavored um, ramen, Korean ramen, which is actually a thing that everyone eats. And the thing that he adds to that is... Um, sirloin steak to give it the 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 signification that it's a a rich person eating it you know to distinguish it from like that which you would just make it yourself at home regardless of class so it's kind of so ramdan is kind of an invention of bong jun ho but it's based on an actual common way of eating ramen gotcha. in korea okay and i've just uh having to bring up the uh the wikipedia page for the stone um so it's it's known as a viewing stone or a scholar's stone. Again, I'm not going to attempt to pronounce the Korean, but um, it's uh, it's a term for rocks that resemble natural landscapes. Uh, whether they're hand carved or they occur naturally, uh, they the natural ones are much more highly prized. Sure. So that's what that is. It's it's part of Korean cultural context that might be lost on people like us. And I th- was in Thanks fact lost on both of us. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's what that is. That's that's basically just a gift from Min to Kiwu to wish him luck in this in this job. Yeah. And as as like a, a saying goodbye gift for the family. That's right. Yeah, so uh, this is one of those movies that's not really like Star Wars, where I don't, I don't think we have to like dwell so much on the events as um as we do on I the, agree. the motifs and the symbolism and the theme, thematic elements and things. Yeah. Um. Real quick, I'll just run through your basic, your your short little rundown of each character. Perfect, and I think that'll be plenty for yeah. context. Yeah. So so Kevin is Kiwu. Um, he's the initial contact between the rest of his family and the park family. Uh, the lie is his friends lie. He doesn't bear a lot of moral responsibility for actually getting the job. Uh, it doesn't replace anybody. Jessica, the sister, uh, Kevin makes up a whole backstory for her invents a career. She makes up what that career is. And, uh, lies about credentials and everything um she teaches well he's he's teaching english to the older daughter of the park family she's doing art therapy for the little traumatized boy um mr kim is the father he he used to be a driver a chauffeur chauffeur whatever and uh is now still that and then miss kim she it seems like her thing anyway was being a housekeeper. So, uh, we know at least one time she folded pizza boxes poorly. She becomes the family's housekeeper after uh, after they all decide that they're going to do something really awful and just set off somebody's allergies that the family went to like great pains to to not yes. aggravate and, because she, and we should highlight. Well, she, I, go I, ahead. I, what I was going to say was that like I I don't know whether or not she. A, a a person like her in the in the position that she was in would would have um, some kind of particular respect in Korean culture. She like seems to be kind of a fixture of the home almost, 
the movie comments on her being more at home than the parks are. She's been in the home longer. She was like the original housekeeper. Right. The driver who uh, is Mr. Tim displaces. It's very rude, but like they later say in the film, like he's probably going to find other work. I'm glad, I'm glad they didn't do what I thought they were going to do, which was frame him for raping Jessica. Yeah, me too. I actually had forgotten and I wasn't sure when we were going up to it in the movie. But yeah, Mr. Mrs. Kim, of course, it's really the thing that they do is the most heinous because they they actually this is the point at which they start to embody the logics or reproduce the logics of the rich people in the house, too, I think, because they displace somebody who's lived there longer than they have, which is something that even the parks didn't do, but easily could have. Right. It was fully within their power to fire her right away. They didn't. So this is a key moment in the film also in terms of um, what it means for them to be there. Yeah, the, the, I mean, the only reason she even gets fired at all was because somebody that the parks decided to place trust in fabricated a story about tuberculosis and then made her terribly sick. Yeah, and we should say also that the level of elaborateness, you could say that with Jessica, the, the, the level of creativity that's used to come up with her career is exceptional and it's it exceeds what happened with Kevin but I would say that with the situation where they where they replace the housekeeper with Mrs. Kim basically they're enacting something just as crazy something just as elaborate and outlandish in real life Well I think it's also I think it's telling that she's the one who dies Yeah no I I, I agree with you I, I'm glad you said that cuz if you hadn't I would have Yeah they at this point they're her the, the level of creativity in her fantasy basically at this point it breaks through and it becomes it fully realizes itself in reality like they're doing horrible things um in order to fabricate the the image that they are trying to create of of you know of the situation they're they're doing a horrible thing in order to manufacture an opportunity yeah i i thought i thought that was going to be like the ultimate evil of the movie was um them sprinkling peach fuzz on i can only call her sis that's the only that's the only thing i remember about her was that she said sis all the time her name is Moon Guang. Yeah, so I think that brings us to let's have this discussion. So the movie definitely is showing us a lot of things and sometimes telling us things. Um, it did a lot of telling. And there's a lot of things. It did a lot of telling. It did a lot of showing. It didn't bother me the way it usually does. No. No, because the telling was done very well. It was usually done by a very effective montage. Right, right, right. In this film, yes, because right, like in other films, you might get you might get lines that stick out as okay, that's expository, that's expositional dialogue. Um, but what happens in this movie is, especially on rewatching, which it really does reward rewatching, you start to pick up on themes that are that, and the way that these themes run through the film as currents is not, they're not introduced all at once; they're introduced little by little, and they snowball. Right. So, an example of this would be. The entire film, we see um, Da Song, the youngest child of the Park family, is shielded from like the realities of poverty. Right? You wouldn't think that that would even be a thing, or just the realities of like the things that are needed to make his life possible. Right? Um, and you don't, but you don't get an explicit line that acknowledges that until the last act of the film. Mrs. Kim is is putting up tables for Da Song's birthday party, and he's sleeping in the tent. And Mr. Park comes out and says, "Shh, he's sleeping." Like you know make make his birthday manifest quieter because you don't want to disturb him this this isn't something that you if that had been the first time that it happened in the film it would have been less interesting um in a lot of movies you know they're much less subtle as well so i just think in terms of this the way that this movie gives you information it doesn't make you feel silly it it feels like the movie respects you but it also goes further than just saying, okay, we're not going to be too direct about that. It makes you feel the themes by dropping symbols and hints all over the movie so that they that they, they, they don't exist just in your conscious mind as like moral guiding uh, lenses. They, they exist as, they're indistinguishable from your experience of, of taking the movie in. You know, they're, they're at an emotional level a lot of the time. And it's, it's really well done.
what is Min gonna think when he finds out about what happened to the Park family? <laughs> he, Whoa. that kid is gonna feel so awful. Yeah, because it's not his fault, but he did it also. Right. I mean, it's it's obviously he's it's implied that he's in a better standing than than um. I mean, he was able to afford to give away his, a money rock. Than Kiwu. Right, of course, exactly. Like he, he clearly his family has money. It's implied that they don't have quite as much money as the Parks, but that the Parks would not, you know, they wouldn't be put off by his smell. Essentially, right? He falls within that boundary of the many boundaries that are drawn explicitly and implicitly around the Parks by themselves and also by the society that allows their existence as a super rich family. Like that's one that he definitely is on the side of the Parks. On he's not a like a kid who smells like a a semi basement. He's like somebody who who goes to college who's who has a bunch of rich friends and i think there's an argument that like it's implied that the rich like kids that he's friends with at school whom he doesn't trust are probably on average a little bit richer than he is but he's definitely not lower class yeah i can't wait until we talk about the smell later i have a lot to say about the smell yeah I, it, like i said that was just a that was just like a gag but like also i'm imagining that like you know, I know there's a TV series coming. I wonder if it's like all about like Min like picking up the pieces of his friendship with Kevin. Oh, I forgot about that. I'm excited for that. Thanks for yeah. reminding me. Um, so so what do you what do you suppose this movie is telling us about how rich and poor people relate to themselves and to each other? Oh my God did did you write that or did I, I at this point? I don't remember. Okay, and. Yeah, I, if I had read that right at the beginning of the movie, I probably wouldn't would have thought about you know vaguer things that I probably remembered from watching it previously. But now I'm like, there's a lot of specific things actually, things that I, I mean, he's showing you the he's showing you the the world that is that is cre that is necessary for a family like the Parks to continue believing naively. I think in in this kind of like good simple easy to navigate world um he's poking holes he's showing he's highlighting the back like the the um just the stark difference between the like the the rich and poor in this movie in general but specifically through the parks of course because there's a lot of poor families that at some point get shown in this movie um but really you only see actually there's a gathering of rich people it's the party there's a gathering of poor people it's the gymnasium where everyone's a temporary climate refugee. Um, yeah, what do you think? Well, I don't know. I was picking. I was picking up a lot. I was getting a lot of mixed signals, or maybe my own wires were crossed while I was. I was watching five and a half hours of this movie, but I kind of, I kind of felt like it was like going out of its way to show that poor people are made savage. And the that that they're willing to acknowledge, like, yeah, I'm mean. That's what you know. That's what the mother says, the mother of the Kim family. You know, she's willing to mm -hmm. acknowledge that she is she is mean, and she's like, it seems like she's doing it on purpose just because she's poor. You know, they they talk about how money is an iron, smooths out rough edges. She said, you know, if I had if I had money, I'd be nice too. I wouldn't have any reason not to be. And the the Park family the Park family is nice. Like, are you going to tell me that yeah. somebody's not nice because like they think somebody smells bad? The Park family is so nice. Right, right. The only the only mistake they make is trusting the Kim family. And they're also obscenely wealthy, which we'll talk about later. Just how wealthy they are compared to the Kims. One thing that I'm picking that you've highlighted for me is that this movie is also about resentment, right? Um, in a in a particular way, um. It's about a type of resentment that you can't communicate. There's a sort of nihilism, um, which I think is justified. I mean, which, which, yeah, which I think, or at least I think it's important to depict in some way and to try to talk about, which is a nihilism about the possibility of communicating your needs and your desires, like for a rich person to a poor person or, or vice versa, right? Like the, you find this in the extremely business-like and cynical, by the way, I noticed that Mrs. Park, she uses the, the phrase, I'll pay him overtime when she's going to make mr kim come to the birthday party you see this sort of like like very business sort of um type relationship 
from the park's perspective or the in the way that they think about of course the people that they've hired in their house right but but again it's it, to them even though they pretend to there are moments when they stop pretending and they reveal that this is you know they're it's not that they're not nice but they remember they remind they remind the kims um in different situations we're your bosses right like we pay you this is not just it's not just regular like we're not equals you know what i mean um so i see this type of resentment coming through but again i think that the the thing that this movie highlights is that yes so from the park's perspective it's like it's in the fact that it's like really a transaction from the kim's perspective the moments when the that i mean it's it's much more obvious right because everything they do is a deception everything they do is we couldn't explain this to you so it's easier to continue to deceive than to to plead for I don't know, some kind of amnesty, um, generosity that we don't expect you to think that you owe us, you know, to try to convince you that you could be doing more. Because if they were to appeal to them as like actually needy poor people who had actual problems, it would it would break the relationship down. The relationship can only be a commercial one, a service based one. It can't be anything genuine, really. And by the way, I think the one character who actually verbally acknowledges this is um um Kiwu at the end or he goes down descends it's, yeah but i think he refers to them as like adults and boring people well when he says do i fit in here that's mm, that's the okay. line that i'm talking about yeah yeah he's he's having he's having a big time identity crisis because he fabricated a false identity for himself and he's been having to inhabit it so much of the time Yeah, so so why do you suppose the parks are so nice? Or do you think they're nice? Do you think they're not nice? Uh, personally, I think as far as bosses go, especially in, like, you know, like, a house-servant relationship, I think they're pretty cool. Like, I mean, they're not, like, dope, but they're, they're they seem like totally nice people where... You know, what I was actually worried about in the movie was that, like, at some point, the parents of the kids were going to decide to throw the other under the bus. When you realize, like, they mm. are a tight-knit, loving family, just like the Parks are. Yeah, absolutely. They have, like, familial solidarity, both of them. Yeah, and, like, blanket spoilers if you weren't paying attention to all the other times we spoiled this movie and every other movie we've ever talked about. Um, did you, did you think it was at the end of the movie when, um, when Mr. Kim, uh, Kim kills Mr. Park? Yeah. Were you like me and f assumed that it was in fact him like holding his nose from the stench of the dead body that set Mr. Kim off? I think that it's something in between begging like we also talked about begging him to like come help his son while he's trying to stop um oh what's her name i can only refer to her as jessica Je when he stopped trying to stop jessica from from bleeding out right it's definitely the combination of that and also um like you said the smell thing that he even though he doesn't, it's like the closest thing that happens in this entire movie, the closest thing to, the two closest things to like class solidarity are when um, the housekeeper's husband is begging Mr. Kim to let him live there right before he fully ties him up and gags him. And the moment when he sees Mr. Park holding his nose, turning over Mr. Kim, sorry, the housekeeper's husband's dying body in order to get his keys. That moment of having to pause that even though he's expecting, because, and here's why it has to be both, right? Because he's expecting Mr. Kim to stop saving, uh, he doesn't know it's his daughter, but it doesn't even really matter, to stop saving the life of somebody who's bleeding out in order to help his unconscious son, right? He's asking him to drop well, his, that. I mean, the son is going to die too. Hmm. The well, movie, no, he's not. The I don't movie, think. Huh? The movie tells us that. The son died? He's, the no, died? the son is going to die if he doesn't get to the hospital. The movie tells us that. He has 15 oh, minutes. Oh, the 15 minutes. Okay, because to be honest, I took that scene. I'm, gl I'm glad you brought that up because I took that scene um, as like 
the the mom as mrs park being like overly concerned like and also like like i i took that from the perspective of mrs kim being like okay like 15 minutes to get to the hospital i was thinking about the fact that like most people can't get to the hospital in 15 minutes especially where mrs kim's from so i took that as maybe not literal I, I didn't necessarily believe her that he necessarily actually had a seizure but i guess we should assume for your for what you're saying let's just assume that he I did mean, the movie right tells okay us, so yes. we have to because that's what the movie tells us it happened okay um yeah i i have like a what might be a wrong interpretation but nonetheless that reading is at least possible for some people because i did experience it that way when i watched the movie um but let's just but i think you're right i think that what it was intended was what you're saying right let's and let's so let's just assume that that's the case so that it's easier to talk about right because i don't want to go too far into the weeds about that so yeah okay so right his kid is it his kid's in danger but even still right like if you have a seizure and you're in danger and you have to get to the hospital in 15 minutes like you're not bleeding out. You know what I mean? Like he could have gotten the keys himself. The well, fact that he Mr. Kim had the keys that because he's and he's no, they were on the ground or he threw them, right? And then they were on the ground. Um okay, right. So he threw them and he kind of missed. Mr. Park is getting the keys. And then when he sees that Mr. Park will even take the time to pause and hold his nose to turn over a dead body to get the keys to help his son but yet was at first demanding that Mr. Kim drop what he was doing in order to help him. And the fact that it's his daughter, I think, is, again, this sort of Bong Joon-ho acknowledging this sort of cynical outlook that the rich and poor can't, like, can't communicate each other's needs to, like, each other's uh, experiences to each other, right? Like, it would, it would, it would betray something in their identities very literally in this case to say that's my daughter don't you understand i have to stop her from bleeding out there's more important things than me being on the clock right now like he's not going to say that obviously um so i think that th that's like symbolically actually just very important but so i think that's why i think it's both right i think it's like him being like i'm trying to save my daughter i can't tell him that and also fuck him like he's telling me like he's he thinks that people like i i, I am are, are so disgusting that he has to hold his nose before moving our dead corpses out of the way that's more important than his son, but I'm not. I'm alive, and I'm not. What I'm doing is not more important to him than his son's health. But this smelly man not offending his picture of reality is 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 more important. That that moment of recognition for Mr. Kim, I think, is what makes him decide to kill Mr. Park. Uh, that because we already know he's given up hope, right? He gives that speech to his son, where it's very clear that he's just, yeah, it's not no plan because it's going to work out. It's no plan because why the fuck even bother you know that moment um when his son all he can say is i'm sorry like and by the way i think that's also the moment when the son fully realizes what he needs to do with the rock which to me i think is basically a physical manifestation of a curse that was placed on them by men by accident yeah he has to use that as that specifically as a weapon to to it's maintain the lifestyle yeah. yeah yeah he doesn't have his father's like hope he doesn't have anything except for this fucking rock which he says has been clinging to him he's looking for something constant in the situation and now the rock is the only thing that's been there the whole time thus answer thus well he tries to make it the answer yeah uh so do do we agree that the kims are the worst people in this movie by far okay. <laughs> absolutely absolutely yeah their kill count's pretty high. Yeah. <laughs> I had to put it bluntly. Well, I, I guess, yeah. They kill the housekeeper. Um, they kill the, what's his, what's his name? The housekeeper's husband. Also, he is murdering people, but they kill him. Um, and they also kill Mr. Kent, yeah, Mr. Park. They also kill Mr. Park. One, three KD. Yeah. Yeah. It's pretty good. Pretty good stats in other circumstances. Yeah, no, I'm yeah. just imagining. So I think we've talked about it. Graded a game of Halo. Yeah. <laughs> did you say? Did you have anything else you wanted to say about how do we feel about the parks? Why they're nice, etc. No, I think we're getting there. Um, cool. Yeah. So, so the Kims are definitely the worst people in this movie, while simultaneously be being like a totally loving family that, like, normally, like anybody would be perfectly happy to be a part of. 
It's like yeah. they they have such a better relationship than I have with my family. They have a real type of a real in- intimacy with each other that you do not see in the parks, despite being nice. Yeah. I, I mean, also you, one of the one of the big moments to me was um. It, it just struck a particular chord with me for one reason or another was um, when they they return home during the monsoon and uh, as their toilet is erupting. And pompeying their home with sewage. Jessica takes the time to like clamp the seat down and have a cigarette. Yeah. I don't know, there was there was there was yeah. something in there about how you know, people will put up with almost anything for a simple pleasure. There's a couple of times in the movie when you're drawn to when when you're asked to 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 return Jessica's gaze, right? There's that moment when she's having the cigarette on top of the toilet, which I think is significant. Um, the other most significant one, I think, is we could all well we could also include the scene when they're all drinking while the while the parks are on vac- on on their camping trip for Da Song's birthday. She's also like prominent in that scene, but also but the the final one is actually as she's bleeding out and the drama of her bleeding out has subsided there's actually after mr park has been stabbed and is lying on the grass dying like she looks over with like a very placid expression on her it's actually cr- kind of creepy and, and and just glances over it at mr park and lifts her head a little bit like if there was no blood coming out of her and you just saw her head you'd be like oh she's just like looking at something while lying mm-hmm. on her back i thought yeah, that scene there, was like whoa she like, she, like kind of seemed like she had kind of just blissed out the whole movie Mm, yeah she like i mean she's a character who i think her coping strategy is is to have like a very guarded internal Mm. life right and they don't show you that by taking you into her internal life they show you that by 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 not showing it's like exactly what somebody like hayao miyazaki does which is it shows you the behaviors of a person and i think the person that these succeeded the most with was jessica maybe she's just the strongest Mm. actress and like it doesn't have anything to do with an intentional choice that was made but i think there i think think there's just too many coincidences about her like her being the standout character her being the one that dies her being the one that has the elaborate story i want to know if you agree with this would you say that every line that she has in the movie um Every line she has in that movie, every action that she takes is either the pr- participating in some kind of deception or defending defending a deception. Like, try to think of one that, that isn't that. Yeah, I mean, that's most characters through the whole movie. I mean, uh, uh, Kevin lets his guard down sometimes. Um, yes. But he also is, like, a great orchestrator of this, this uh, coup. Um. Yeah, that's true. Mr. Kim lets his guard down as well. Yeah, he's he's like end, pretty sensitive through a lot of the movie. Actually, yeah, there, you get the impression through the entire movie that he's like, he's doing just what he has. Oh my god! Actually, this connects to some dialogue too. He's doing just what he has to in order to maintain the deception. He's not like not really losing himself in it in the way that I think you could argue that Jessica does. Yeah, like as soon that, as he's in, he's just like back to being the same guy. Seems like. And guess, I mean, it's no coincidence. Who is the one character that this gets commented on? It's Mr. Kim. When Mr. Park and, and Mrs. Park are on the couch, like, is it when they're on the couch getting, like, about to have sex when, when he says, like, yeah, Mr. Well, he's talking about the smell because he smells Mr. Kim because he's under the couch and he doesn't know it. But he says also, like, you know, he always goes up to the line, but he never crosses it. And I'll give him credit for that. That's the thing. He's he's keeping as much of himself in. He's not trying. He's like you realize at the end of the movie that Mr. Kim is like who his son is growing into. Somebody who's never really given up hope but suddenly feels like he has to. And I think that's why that moment is so significant when all that all that Kevin can do, all that Kiwu can do is mourn his father losing his hope in that moment in the gymnasium cuz he's kind of the realest one. But then, but but even he draws it into question. Okay, 
just to riff a little more, um, again, when they're all around the table drinking the night of the camp out, um, the moment when Mrs. Kim is comparing her husband to a cockroach and the whole family's kind of giggling and then it gets tense and he's like, I don't like it. And he knocks glass off the table and gets really serious and grabs her shirt collar. I mean, like, that's like, you don't, you don't know. And then, and then of course they, they're in their relationship. They draw attention to, to the, to the tension explicitly. And they're like, uh, you know, and she's like, I know that you wouldn't do that. Cause if you did, I'd kill you, you know, and they know it's a joke and the kids don't that it shows two things, right? One of them is that you don't really know Mr. Kim because you kind of have to assume that it is a joke. There's an I mean, alien moment that gaze between so. them. She certainly seems to think so, but she even holds on to, you have to ask yourself, is she at first scared and then says, okay, no, I know this is a joke. Like you, the viewer, or is she like totally acting as hard as he is at that moment? And you get the feeling afterwards that she's acting also, but nonetheless, it feels like witnessing a real situation. It feels like if you had really witnessed in that real life, you'd have that in real life. You'd have as many questions. You'd be like, "What the fuck do it's I?" Really? So the other really thing that it says, other than right, the other thing that it says, other than Mr. Kim has a, a side that we don't see actually, is that also like his family doesn't know for sure if that side is like like when he's being kind of... real, even though they perform the the, the I think the the the, the genuinely committed loving family like really intimately understand each other that's a moment that kind of reveals that even that is a little bit in question yeah i kind of i kind of half got the vibe that it was like a trick they do at cocktail parties it felt like that except what cocktail parties (laughs) crazy ones (laughs) but i just mean that like it just but seems like they don't in have time reality, for it seems parties. like it seems like Mrs. Kim realized like about one second after she didn't get hit, like, oh, I know what this is. We're fucking with the kids. Yeah, I I, I agree with your analysis. I, it felt like for a second it wasn't clear whether or not she knew what was going on, which of course itself is a form of abuse, you know, but. But not. But it doesn't read. It doesn't read as abuse to her. Is is the point? Like she doesn't rash. She rationalizes it as, of course, you're joking because I know that if you weren't, even, that one second is backed up. Like I don't worry about that one second where I wasn't sure because I know what would happen if you didn't. And in fact, Bong Joon Ho has at least has actually explicitly talked about this. He his intention was that she's not to be fucked with. Like she used to the silver medal on her wall. She was like a, a shot put medalist. Like she's. Like she's tough. That was the symbolism of her being a shot put medalist. Was that like uh, he he poses real no real threat to her. So at least Bong Joon Ho's intended reading we know was that she didn't really feel it in danger in that situation. Not the only reading, but it was the intended one. circle around to the uh, the motifs and symbolism at the end then oh let's the do that now thing. let's do that now i'm into it okay yeah so we'll just run through these quick i guess uh so the rain i mean the rain like water is always like one that you i can never quite tell what it means like sometimes it means like restoration uh a cleansing sometimes sometimes like this well, it's, it's like super right. impressive it's literally a, it's a monsoon that, that yeah. happens um right if it's a cleansing it's it's a kind of a perverse one it's like a it's not so much like a like a force of like knowledge and truth being revealed as just an oppressive bludgeoning that forces people to act in like act in ways that it forces people's selves to be exaggerated to the extent that they can't main that the self underneath whatever illusion they're maintaining is revealed in terms of how the rain affects what the parks see, right? That's the effect of the rain on the parks. But for the people of the city, it's just like, fuck, like, where are we going to go? Like, our shit's being ruined. Yeah, I I mean, I I said it whenever, or maybe I wrote it, I don't know. But the 
Park family, they get their camping trip ruined, and what their experience of the monsoon is, is a bad camping trip, and then they just pick up the camping trip again at home. This their little their little boy who mm. is like who has like serious trouble is like free to go out and like camp in his tent in in the monsoon where we see the slums and people's homes are flooded, destroyed. I mean every possession save like a couple photographs ruined. Uh, so then, then we got smell. Smell seemed to be a pretty big motif. Um, I don't, I don't know the subway smell we're talking about. I know the basement smell. That's one I'm familiar with. Um, but one that, one that caught me off guard was, um, was when Mr. Park described Mr. Kim's smell as being of radishes. They refer to that as old person smell. That's not that's not the old person smell that I have picked up on. Cuz I was like, "Oh man, he smells like grilled cheese." But it was radishes. Right, I love how like people well, th- right, cuz the fact of it is that the reason that you have to say that old person smell smells like radishes is cuz it would be obscene. I don't mean this from a personal standpoint, but just in a a general cultural way, it would be obscene. To just speak of old person smell as as a smell that is easy to know and describe and to generalize about it in the way that you can with radishes. Well, it's like how all little kids smell like waffles. You have, to, you have to compare it to something else. <laughs> yeah. And then as yeah. you get older, you just smell like whatever vice you happen to have. Right. And then That's it circles around to grilled cheese. That's but right. smell was super prominent in this movie. Um... It just it just sets up like a class divide. It's it's like the arbiter of that for this movie. This is a movie that has a lot to say about appearances, so I think it's quite appropriate that they appealed to another sense in order to talk about intuitive things that aren't necessarily on the surface, right? If it was just like that they like I don't know, that their hair looked different, it would have been silly and boring, but the fact that its smell is important. Right. right. The fact that smell is also the, the sense that impresses itself the most on your memory. Not to say that Da Song would have smelled um, the housekeeper's husband, but like this is a, a traumatic event that he has. Well, whether or not he has PTSD, the family, family treats it as though it's, it's top priority, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, so, then, so then we have elevation. Um, they're constantly ascending to the park house. Park house as far as the parks mm-hmm. are aware, anyway, it is mostly built up. Even though I found that's it, right uh, on the Wikipedia page that it was actually only a single story. Uh, the the park house ascends. Wow. They yeah. leave the park house. They take stairs down. They travel downward, down an incline, away from the park house. They descend stairs. They go further down another incline. And they keep going down, and eventually they, you know, they live the the parks or uh, the Kims. Sorry, the Kims and their neighbors all live, you know, in these sub basement houses, and that's where the um, the sis family lives as well as in a sub basement. <laughs> Which is that's a, that's another thing that I didn't expect to go the way it did. I thought it was going to be like. I thought I thought they were gonna let the the family of the housekeeper, her and her husband, I thought they were gonna let them stay at the Kim household. I thought that's what I had no idea what this movie was going into it, if I haven't said that. Mm-hmm. I think there's something to the fact that the 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 semi basement, right, which is Again, it's the thing that like we kind of lack cultural context for, but as a symbol in the movie, we can say a couple of things, you know, without. Well, I mean, the, I mean, the idea of specifically of a semi basement has oh, like, it's like a, a receptacle for poor South people, Korea yeah. that. Yeah, that I don't. Yeah, I, that's okay. all I mean. Um, so, yeah. Um, but the fact that it's a semi basement, which like it's a basement that you can see outside, right? The symbolism of being half underground, 
but that the the the, the fact of being above ground at all is sort of like a it doesn't it's kind of nullified in the real world right by the fact that you're half underground in the logic of the movie right and then so you can see above ground but you're not really above ground um no you just could have peek and then i think it's telling though that yeah exactly i think it's telling i think it's telling that the basement in the in the park's house which is really ends up being the important basement the basement that ends up i think accruing the most metaphorical meaning throughout the movie is a full basement completely shut out from the outside world yet completely in the center of a very very affluent person's house like you're the closest you're the closest to what has already been set up as the symbol for like poverty when you're actually right in the center of wealth yeah i mean that harkens like to the photos that you always see that compare like the shanty town that's right next door to like a golf resort or something. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Right. It's more, it's more, it's the, the, right. Exactly. The, the, the bunker basement is more basement than basement. Right. It's like, a, it's beneath the basement. Yeah. 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 So, so, so that's elevation. Uh, what's, what's the next one? Education. Um, yeah. So, I I guess education uh kind of ties pretty well into the hell Josun Josun thing um that we have to talk about. So this movie goes out of its way to show that that the Kim family that the original housekeeper, I mean she seemed to like be doing pretty well for herself. But the Kim family like like we've said before is entirely capable of of performing in the roles that they adopt. Uh, I mean, Kevin's probably the least impressive one, I guess. He's just teaching English and, like, making out with a teenager. But, like, Jessica, like, she had me convinced. I, I, before the show tonight, I looked up the Schizophrenia Zone. Because I was like, yeah, that, oh, wow, that sounds right. Sounds like it could be. Uh, it wasn't, I guess. But Mr. Kim is a perfectly capable driver. Miss Mrs. Kim is a perfectly capable housekeeper. Aside from the fact that she doesn't know how to make made up soup. Um. Even that, she figures it out. Gotta yeah, give her credit. <laughs> she googled it. Which I now know she couldn't have done. But I'll forgive that. Um. But. So, so this whole Joseon concept, um, Joseon, as far as I understand, is the Korean name for Korea. Uh, it may be that it was um, the name of a particular dynasty that has like specific esteem in Korea, but I, I believe it's I believe it is a Korean name for Korea. Um, it's it's this idea that you can't lift yourself out of poverty because the mechanisms by which one would do that are locked from people in poverty um you can't you can't just get any education you know you can do pretty well for yourself with a community college you know what are they what is that degree two-year bachelor is that what it is associate associate You can do pretty well for yourself with an associate degree from even the shittiest of community colleges here in America. Most people just care about the piece of paper. Where, you know, in this movie, it's not the piece of paper that matters. It's the recommendation, right? Yeah, I mean, it's the, the, the piece of paper. doesn't matter. You know, the reason that you can, the reason that you can say, the reason that Mrs. Park can say, oh, the, the qualification doesn't matter is because it's so assumed that, of course, you would have it. It's not because there's a risk of him not having it, but but something else is more important. It's because the fact that the friend recommended him implies... It wouldn't be possible for somebody to apply for the job if they didn't yes, already meet the yes. prerequisites, yeah. Yes. In terms of the literal meaning of her words, it doesn't matter what degree you have. It's a, it's not a literally meaningful statement. Yeah. Yeah. So so basically how, how Joseon describes like the state of Korea amongst young uh, from the perspective of a number of young people you know 
I, I've read about their work culture, which is that like companies typically recruit from a specific university or a small number of universities. Um, if you somehow find yourself in that company without being from that university, but you end up working alongside people who did go to that university, you're not in the you're you know you're not in the club. You're in the out group. Um, even if you you know you could have gone to a better university, but you didn't go to the right one. It's that sort of thing. So so the idea is that young people in poverty, uh, you know, normal people, not, like I'm sure exceptional people can get ahead just like they can anywhere, but a normal young person in poverty can't lift themselves up out of poverty because the like I said, the mechanisms to do so are walked away from them. So, so that's basically the concept of hell, Josan. Uh, cyclical nature of poverty. You must have had successful parents to become a successful adult because the economic situation does not allow for the inverse to be true. Do you know what this reminds me of? It reminds me of something we said last week when we were recording the show of an appendix, um, which is that jail in some way produces the archetype of hell. You know, real world conditions of being trapped produce hell. Then let me ask you this, right? Assuming that premise in some way applies in this movie for the general conditions of poverty that people live in. And also, actually, no, actually, no, for specifically the threat of jail time that that Mr. Kim, Mrs. Kim and Ki Woo face at the end of the movie. It's said explicitly like, you're lucky that you're getting off on just. I don't know why that's what they're told, right? I don't know why that's true. What did like? Mm. Right? Why they didn't, didn't they go to jail? Any crimes. Those two. Oh. They listed some of the crimes. It was like, you know, it was things that. All of the crimes were things that happen all the time, and then self-defense was thrown in, which I think he was talking about generally the words that he remembers from the haze of being in court. Um, but it was like, it was, yeah, it was like, um, fraud, you know, forgery, stuff like that. You know, these sort of like legalistic crimes that of course, yeah, rich people also Jessica, engage Jessica in. Jessica did the but, forgery. Yeah. Completely. Yeah. And Mr. Kim murdered Mr. Park. Well, how about this? Mr. Kim vanished and Jessica's dead. And okay, yeah, so the, a, a rich family yeah. got torn apart. You know, who do you punish? Property was destroyed. People were I killed. Who do right, you punish? Yeah. Mr. Kim died. Yeah, there's not a fair... Like we were talking about last week, like fair trial doesn't exist, you know? Um, I guess, yeah. I so can't I think that could be... The situation there's enough wiggle the room there. For... South Korean criminal justice system, but... By the fact that the Miranda rights are referenced as the Miranda rights, I have a feeling that a lot of legal proceedings are based on those that take mm -hmm. place in the U.S. I don't know the details, but that to me was a, a telling detail. Um, yeah, they certainly said it enough. It wasn't just in the translation. He said, Mur "He said, Mur yeah." So, so that right, like, um, I guess I just always assume that every society is more enlightened than ours. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Is the semi is the semi basement just purgatory? Is it just a symbol? You're it. I mean, because that's literally where they they avoid hell, right? They don't go to prison. And they're back. He's back where he started. He and his mom are back where they started. Half above ground, half underground. Yeah, they don't get they they don't get to stick around in heaven either. Um, I don't know. I guess I guess it depends on whether you think that purgatory is a place that you get stuck, or if purgatory is a place that you transition away from. Um, I think he was trying pretty hard to transition away. But from he it. doesn't. We know he doesn't. Yeah. I think purgatory contains both where he lives and where the parks live. That's the strange thing about it. Yeah, I just I think the only place that it that there's anything like heaven is higher up on the mountain where he sits and waits for his dad's message. He eclipses the old park house. Do you mean in the sense that like in his fantasy he imagines he'll buy it? Or do you mean in a Well I just, I just mean that like he like I don't I don't know what the word for like rising above it in terms of elevation is, so I said eclipse. <laughs> 
he ends up at a higher ele- ele- mm-hmm. elevation when he s- sees the Morse code from his dad. He's looking right. down and then, at the house. Of course, there's the there's the tease, right? That like, does he? He sees his dad's message and he gains hope to to buy the house. But of course, the very last shot of the movie leaves us with him just writing a letter. I think it's the only scene in the movie where they show you somebody imagining something and they cut back to them and it's not real. And it, I didn't even notice the other one until this time, this third time watching it. Do you know what I mean? Do you know what the other no. one was? Well, I'm sure maybe I do, but say it. The housekeeper, the housekeeper, when she comes down the stairs to help her husband, mm-hmm. she walks over to him and she starts tearing at his bonds with yeah. her teeth. And she's saying, I'm dizzy, I'm dizzy. And you're like, oh, she's freeing him. And then it cuts. And I, I missed this. It cuts. She she got down the stairs, collapsed, and never got up again. That's where she dies. She never made it over to her husband. She was imagining but he got that out, in her final But, but he got out, though. Yeah, but... I, I assumed that it was just cutting between two different times. Maybe. But again, why is she back? Why do they show her literally in the exact same position well, she was in a moment I didn't, before? I didn't pick up on that, but I... There's only so many ways to come down a narrow staircase. I don't know. That's true. That's true. He does. I mean, he does get out. You're right. But it, I, I think it was implied to me that it took him a long time to get out, and then he eventually did. I guess that could be. Uh, I kind of got the impression that this, that the final events of this movie, like once once we get over like the the big montage of like they're doing activities with the family, like grocery shopping and all that, I kind of got the impression that everything took place over like a day from like when they, when they, you know, they have their row with the, the other family and then the party. Yeah. That was like a day. It was like the next day in in my mind. It was the next day in my mind that uh, they had the redo party. Yeah. Cause that's where the, yeah. So I were talking about like paying overtime and stuff. It's like we had to impose on them for something that wasn't planned. Yeah. So I've written a lot here and I want to read some of it. But, um, you, well, you added something that I didn't see in here, which is, um, wealth and whiteness. Mm -hmm. So you want to tell me about that? Uh, Yeah, I'll say a little bit, but I also, it's further down. I elaborate a little bit. Um, so when I say wealth and whiteness, I mean, constantly, um, whiteness white colonial values and views of the world are used by the parks to project status right they're important to their family identity they talk about american the type of they yeah are impressed by jessica's american education okay mr parks got a thing on the wall about like some success he had in new york city with some kind of map that his tech company created um you know there's there's the thing about Da Song and, and American Indians, which it took me a, a little bit of time to think through and figure out why this relates. But it does, I mean, even the the, the thing that manifests destiny, right? Like the thing that, that allowed America to be the, the, the force that keeps English as a colonial global language alive after the collapse of the British Empire is like the complete removal of um, indigenous people across the entire country. Like, like and that that struggle the 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 closest thing to any realization that like a genocide a massive genocides were committed across an entire continent in order to like allow for the current world order that the parks participate in benefit from you know identify with is 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 like is just to da song and also to the family and to the boy scout leader who got Dawsong interested in this cartoonized version of American Indians is just like it's just the flimsiest of romanticizations but also that you but but it's an interest but it's an important one because I mean he's obsessed with like the survival skills the aesthetics the imagined personality of like the noble Indian you know and and that that masks a history of struggle against genocide like that resilience isn't just oh like it's not as it's it's related to the fact that like native americans in the white mind have been made to be like part of nature and all of that but it's more than that it's like also the ways in which uh, you know the 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 um 
close to nature uh mythos cross pollinates with the like well they have to survive because they're being killed and to him there's no difference it's just this it's just the romanticized native american person it's there's no depth to it at all and no one is ever in his life going to show him that depth and to show him that history it's safe to him because it's so removed from him there's no way that that image could get to him in his current life das long's current life with any of its actual uh important uh constitutive elements intact it's just a cartoon it's a complete simulacrum of a simulacrum you know yeah and the mother talks about having bought the tent from amazon so yeah and how it's, it's from funny. the u.s so yeah. it's good the english names the the interspersing of english phrases in a way that is you know like at specific situations to 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 portray to project like a certain aesthetic um and image it's 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 all of that it's the identification of with whiteness of the rich in this situation um i also wanted to say a couple of things um related to the monsoon right and it may go out to other things from there so i'm going to read from the document and i also want to see maybe you could respond with some thoughts on the notes that you wrote so here we go so let's talk about the rain motif. External events affect rich and poor differently. The big one, of course, is the monsoon. For the city's poor, it displaces thousands. For the rich, it may ruin a camping trip. Da Song's birthday being ruined arguably takes up more emotional space in the movie than the flooding of thousands of families' homes. Families living in semi-basements like the Kims, often. Um, makes me think about the climate crisis and can be read as a metaphor for it, really. You know... These people are temporary climate refugees, essentially. I had been wondering about the choice to have Dasong be obsessed with American Indians, and I think I've already elaborated on that. Did you want to say what your thought was about that that you'd written? Yeah, uh, so so what I wrote was that uh, about American Indians, I feel the sentiment may be that younger generations kind of gather the aesthetics of of the colonized, the conquered, the poor, um, I mean, you see that all the time, right? You see, like, there's no reason for, like, Kim Kardashian to wear ripped jeans, right? Like, people wear ripped jeans out of necessity because those are the pants you have. But, like, actually, they're a luxury item that you pay extra money for. You know, even though what they imply, <clears throat> you know, jeans are like a working person's pant, Right. And, you know, it implies that, like, they're rough, you know, you wear them while you're out doing your day's work. I mean, the th what, what, for me, jeans are specifically associated with cowboys, right? You know, um, so, so that's, that's something you see a lot. Like, you know, nobody, like, nobody does, like, American Indian cosplay because they're like I just love this culture and like I want to be a part of it it's like I love the way this looks it has this particular aesthetic that I like um and and so so this this is juxtaposed against the um so so they colonize the rich people's house right they move in and take over both both families do um, to varying degrees of su success, I would say the housekeeper's family does better at it. Um, but in this movie, it's the the juxtaposition is that it's an innocent child. I mean, presumably he might, you know, he may have launched a WMD or something that we don't know about because the movie didn't tell us. But we have to presume this child is an innocent regular child just playing with beloved toys compared to two families like doing crimes and murders against each other and like triggering anaphylaxis against each other you know and and so it's it's this rich kid that's playing with his toys against these poor people that are conniving and you know obviously it's the rich person colonizing the poor people's stuff and the poor people colonizing the rich people's stuff that's why that's why I have some trouble with this movie. Um 
mm-hmm. just in terms of interpreting it because it's, I, I'm picking up at every turn mixed signals. Yeah. And, you know, I think, I think this movie for, for all the ways that it succeeds in like, it has a pretty like interesting narrative structure. It's almost, um, it's almost got like an HP Lovecraft style story. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, I see he would probably do the same thing. Actually, he would probably suggest that the rich people that play with poor people toys are actually noble for like trying to empathize or something. It's like, uh, you know, yeah. rich people get like raggedy end dolls, right? I don't know. I mean, Maybe. people that can afford to have like disposable income to spend on toys, you're buying a raggedy end doll. Maybe. Yeah, probably a lot of the time. Yeah. If you have a lot of toys. I just mean that Raggedy Ann is like a silly poor person. You know? Oh, uh, like it's kind of like the clown poor person. Yeah, exactly. I mean, the name is yeah. Raggedy. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, it's interesting that you use the word colonization, and you're right. Like, even though it's absurd, and I think that you've revealed to me, you've focused something for me, like, which is that there's an element of this movie that is. Yes, equalizing, um, ambivalent. I did read that that in, interview by Bong Joon Ho, and I was a little bit almost. I have to say, I have to admit, uh, disappointed that he was basically talking like, "Yeah, the rich and the poor, they can't understand each other." You know, it's like tomato, tomato. I mean, no, I'm that's unfair. Okay, let me just kind of let me. I can let that rest. But basically, just yeah, no, it's just that he um. He definitely, I feel like this movie can, I want to say that I don't think that his message is necessarily, I would argue that Snowpiercer basically has a Marxist message. I don't think this movie does. I think there's Marxist elements. There's Marxist like intuitions in the way that he writes the script and the things that happen, but it's not in the same way a Marxist movie. Um, I don't know where 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 Snowpiercer felt like a like a Marxist movie with a critique of Marxism kind of at its center. Um, also, this feels like a non-Marxist movie that also has a bit of the elements of it has Marxist ideas, but they have not coalesced into, into feeling like a Marxist. There's a Marxist structure to this movie, that, um, and there is definitely also critique of certain things that are pretty essential to Marxism. Um, for example. I mean, again, there's the, the the poor people in this movie, they're like, it's not that they're not idealized, it's that they're kind of shown as being, a lot of the time, kind of monstrous, right? Um, conniving, etc. Um, but again, I, somehow I still think this movie can be saved, and let me try to, maybe try to do it. Um, so similar to the dynamic that we see with like, the the surface level romanticized image of the American Indian being the only thing that anybody in the family knows how to engage with in that context, we see something similar with the dynamic between the Parks and the Kims. And this gets manifest in the dialogue between Kim and Park, Mr. Kim and Mr. Park, when they're in the car, I think for the first time. And you hear, maybe not for the first time actually, but you hear Mr. Kim, you hear Mr. Kim say something like, you know, it's a strange companionship between, you know, a, 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 a head of a household, wealthy CEO, and, a, you know, a lonely driver who leaves his house every morning only to, you know, I don't know, to serve you on the roads, essentially, is essentially what he says. And he knows in this moment that that's basically the image that will reassure Mr. Park and will, like, Put put him further, like we'll agree with Mr. Park's conception of him and what the limits of him are, um, right? So that's a significant dialogue to me because it it's Mr. Kim himself putting forth this image of a a romanticized poor person, a safe poor person, that meshes with the world that he thinks Mr. Park and I think correctly guesses Mr. Park inhabits. Even if Mr. Park's a little bit skeptical of things, more so especially than Mrs. Park. This image to him is essentially comforting. Yeah, I mean, they seem like they totally vibe with each other. All parts of the family. Yeah, you. Ha- the thing that's insane uh, is that if, if you were to watch a movie that was that was made, if you were to watch a movie that was made from the perspective of of the Parks, that was about the same period of time and the same characters, it would be a completely different movie, and it would be what you see at the end when the when the um, journalist is is on the TV in the background, you know, as. Um, Kiwu is like writing his letter and, and reflecting, right? It would be basically 
this like this weird like sporadic murder case who knows why these two different men both murdered people we just have no explanation he disappeared that's essentially it would be just a completely anomalous event the the trauma that is experienced by the people who have to make their life possible even though the movie ends and there's an explosion the people who it affects the or the park family in particular they're none the wiser they have no idea any of the internal dynamics that created what they witnessed yeah, and, and, they, what, what and they just to get to leave it behind also yeah i mean one of them dies but yes yeah Yeah, well some might say that he left it behind the hardest uh yeah i mean so so the part of the brief for the television show that i read was that it takes place like between the lines of the movie like it covers the things that you don't Mm. see in the movie which i mean that could just be like an artist being cryptic and not saying exactly what they mean, but I agree. It could mean a lot of things. Yeah. I what I, I would be really interested rather that the TV show was the same events from the perspective of the park family. Yeah. Cause I think, I think that one of the things that this movie does that makes me think it doesn't have a consistent message, you know, or that it doesn't, it doesn't elocute that message in a consistent way is that it doesn't really have a perspective like it's like fourth person or something you know what i mean dude i know exactly what you mean when you say it's fourth person i had also a very similar feeling of dislocation while watching this movie like whose perspective who is this an allegory there's no there's not really any point of view character it's like yeah the movie is made from like bong joon ho's perspective or something yeah it's like an allegory for like for like an alternate version of him that you're supposed to s- sympathize with. I don't know. It's it, yeah. Well, the camera he's, itself. Really? He's the park family, isn't he? Mm hmm. But like, yeah, the movie like doesn't dwell enough with them. I mean, it empathizes enough with everybody that I, I can't say that it favors right. any one particular you know, element of the cast or that it, what, you know who he is more even than the Park family? No. He's the architect Nam Gung who lived oh, there before. Yeah, sure. Right? He's somebody who's risen on an artistic reputation to fame and influence and who later could be co-opted in exactly the same way as that art- architect by some other family that wants a house that, that um, puts status on them. I want to comment that I just think it's very cool. I don't want this to be a big thing, but I want to say that I think it's very cool that every scene, as I said to you earlier, is kind of a slice of life. It's like, it gives you a lot of detail. It gives you intimate interactions. It doesn't quite give you the mundaneness of everyday life. There's not a lot of long shots of single actions, but the dialogue gives you that feeling of the everyday. But it's interspersed with these crazy little glimpses at a conspiracy that that half the cast has no idea is going on, right? Um, so it shows the bird, it, it manifests the burden on the poor as like, basically we have to figure out how to run a machine. We have to make ourselves into a mechanism. Um, it's almost like they're sucked into their position at, by, by some kind of a tractor and more on that later. I have, I want to end with that. I think I know what it is. It's almost like the archetypes of like the various household positions that did exist before they got there and potentially existed like the full-time art tutor, you know? attracted a family to them were created in some way there was some sense in which on some level they could optimally be performed by a family but some other contradiction in the way that that, that the system was set up caused that result to totally eat them um but nonetheless again there were strengths of them all being related it was the fact of, of their secret being like it if their secret was blown, then then something about the ideology that allows the parks to inhabit the world they inhabit would be punctured. 
Therefore, that was the thing that was always avoided, right? You could, they could never admit that. And that, that constantly brought them into tension with like the positive things that being a family, serving a family offered them. Um, so I want to also say that I noticed that the only time that I really see remorse, except very at the very end with, with Kiu, um in the gym, the only time that I see remorse earlier in the movie is when is when Kiwu is like sitting around the table with the rest of the family, and I think maybe Mr. Kim also expresses a little bit of worry just about like the ethics of what they do, and and and, and I want to draw the attention of the listener and potential viewer of this movie to the fact that it's only when they are as far in as possible to the fantasy of they live in the house that they're able to to think. I guess, like they've said themselves in this exact same scene, like rich people do, um, like it, with this more like compassionate gaze, like they're they're at the top for all intents and purposes. In that moment, they live at the top of that social hierarchy, and then they feel a little bit bad for the people that they displaced to get there. It is the only time in the film, other than the very end when things are totally going to shit, that you hear yeah, anything like this. It's also in the same moment that they like. They the second they find comfort, which honestly it kind of seemed like they had. Like it kind of seemed like they chose to leave comfort behind. To to like shoot for this crazy aspiration that they decided they have. Right. I think I know what the parasite is. I think you just made me fully. It's like the logical conclusion to something I was going to say at the end, and now I'm going to add that to it. Well, it's none of the characters, right? It's none of the characters. It's, it's I wonder if we'll agree. Circumstance. Yeah, but what is the symbol of that circumstance? We'll get back to that. Um, okay. Well, yeah, it's just it's it just the the second that they actually grasp what they wanted, they they just they get one second to live the high life before it, everything tumbles around them. They find out mm-hmm. about the family in the basement. Right. Or, well, at the moment when it's but... at the moment when you're perceiving them as okay, we're in a reprieve from the kind of storm that we're normally yeah, in. Yeah, the, te- the deception tension has finally come down. They've right. They've That's let it the all moment go. when you you find out everything is not what it seems. You find out in the heart. You find out in the heart of the like the entity, which is this house. Right, is a complete mystery, an alien mystery. Right after that, and also right before we find out about that, we see that Jessica. Excuse me. Um, she's drunker than everybody else, right? Again, even in the moment when, like, everyone else is being ge- genuine, she's, like, the most gone, right? To harken back to what we were discussing earlier about how she presents herself in the movie. Um, she's basically like, fuck it, like, don't talk to me about, don't talk to me about what we've done. She gets pissed. She's, like, belligerent about it. She, her role in that situation is policing the narrative. Like, she, at this point, can't hear, she can't hear a perspective that challenges what she needs to do day in and day out to like maintain the character of Jessica. Also, they refer to her as Jessica in this scene. And I think that's also to to draw your attention to, to her identification, not by choice, but like, like in desperation with the, like for survival reasons with the character of Jessica that she has to embody when the, when the park family is there, she is the one in that circle who's not experiencing that house as in a fantasy. Like she's always in the fantasy it's kind of dark. Well, yeah, I mean, she's the one who actually left her personality behind. And the thunder strikes, and they make a big deal out of it, that it, it, it marks what she says as though it's true, cosmically true. Yeah, and they, they call specific attention to that through the dialogue. Yes. One other thing I picked up on, what do you, what do you think the deal was with um, Kiwa saying it's so metaphorical all the time? Oh yeah, I forgot to write that down, but I I also wanted to talk about that. I think it's to draw your attention to the metafictional elements of the film. Like this idea that like he's using a word that it's not that it's subversive in a way, right? It's not that he like doesn't know what the word metaphorical means, but it's that he like doesn't care that it doesn't really make sense. It just like conveys something to him on an aesthetic level to say this is metaphorical. Yeah, I mean, it's symbolically I was like, this is the fucking guy that would be teaching English. Is the guy that he says it makes three times, maybe? 
two times? I think, I think, three, says I think three is the correct number, yeah. I would love to go back and watch the three times because the first time actually it sets up what I want to end with as well about what the parasite is. Um, I think it's significant the first time, and I'm sure it is the other times, but I just don't remember exactly what he says. Um, yeah. Um, the housekeeper controlling the lights. Right, that's that's something significant, I think. Um, what did I say? Oh yeah, it's a commentary on. I think it's a maybe an intentional, specific. You know, sometimes with a movie that's this rich in symbols, you just get accidental commentary on things because that's just how stuff works. Um, it's almost like you're like approximating the higher, well, the alternate reality that you're that you're commenting on, meaning what we perceive as the real world, with like symbols, and then because you're, it's almost like a dig, a lower level digital representation, but in that digital representation, you can make out all of these like other suggested symbols maybe digital is the wrong metaphor but let's let me just leave it at that and i want to say this um um he it's about automation like it, you realize from the when you when you suddenly inhabit the perspective of mrs kim seeing the lights turn on going up the stairs as mr kim arrives they and she says oh the sensor is wacky or whatever they just they perceive those lights going on as as being sensor operated this man who lives in the basement is so identified with Mr. Park, with the house itself, that they have failed to notice that the irregularities that he contributes to, like, the flashing of those lights is anything but a technical issue. Well, when it's the Morse code that he's tapping on the light switch, it's a technical issue. When it's the lights turning on and off, it's just the sensors operating as they're supposed to. This man represents represents the... What happens, the, the particular way in which rich people get alienated from the world as rich people, right? They perceive the world as functioning without them, around them, for them predictably. They perceive things that are highly contingent on labor as completely predictable, natural background parts of the world. And this relates directly to the central trauma of the movie as experienced by Da Song, which is that he sees a ghost. His mother superstitiously avoids keeping the family there on birthdays because one year Da Song saw a ghost and that turns out to be why Jessica's there. It's the art therapy. It's all to get to Da Song to help him process that experience of seeing the ghost. When their ritual plan, their almost magical ritual of avoiding the house on his birthday fails, meaning they have to come home from their birthday camping trip, that's when shit goes to shit. I think there's two curses at play in this movie and I'm just going to kind of drop now what I mean by the parasite the parasite is the rock, right? It's what the rock represents. It's the scholar's stone. Min gives them hope. He gives them the basically what the what I would call the American dream if this was an American movie, right? And that's why Ki Woo says this is so metaphorical. Because to him, that rock is shit. Like, it's a burden of hope. It's, it's the chance to go for it. And I would argue that the parasite is the ghost of hope that takes possession of the family it's no wonder that basically they almost seem to autonomously move into the house as a unit. It's as if they're being guided by something that none of them really understand. And I think that's the key. The, 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 the missing character in this movie is like the, the attractor that pulls them into the house. I think if you re rewatch this movie and you ask, do they have any choice? I'm not saying that they don't, and I'm not saying it's the only reading, but there's a, almost a a clowning kind of reading of this movie, which is like making fun of you for perceiving any of the actions that the Kims undertake as conscious choice. The, the, the shallow reading is just like, oh, like, well, they feel like they have no choice, but they're so cynical. They're actually like pieces of shit. It's like, no, like, let's just imagine that there's a real fantastical element that is not acknowledged by the director in any discreet way. That rock, it's like the fucking ring in Lord of the Rings. That's why um, Kiwu feels like he has to bring it back to the house. It's been sitting in the sub-basement all this time, right? Like halfway above ground and halfway underground. He needs to bring it to the house in order to plunge it into the actual basement and kill literally what he sees as like the last, the last thing standing between him and his family having happiness in this house. And he thinks that he's going to break the curse. His dad gives up hope at the same moment that he's deciding what to do. And when he says that I'm gonna, I have to go down, and she says to the people down there, no, farther down. He's going into like hell, basically, to try to destroy um, um, the housekeeper's husband. And of course, 
he fails in his attempt to do that, and he basically brings to light a literal manifestation of um, Da Song's trauma. And I think basically he, he, in his attempt to end one curse, he like reawakens another one that is a curse on the parks, which has to do with like the price they pay for a house in which they can ignore the underbelly of society, right? Like that basement underneath them, that's like, that's, that's the underworld that, and, and again, it's explicitly said Nam Gung was embarrassed when he sold the house. He didn't tell them about the basement. He was embarrassed. They never knew this cavity inside of their house existed. They are more unaware than, than the, the Kims and the housekeeper and her husband of this underworld than anybody. He was embarrassed about what his, he knows. And again, this is also our, I think, reference. This is a, also maybe a connector, how you could justify the interpretation that there's a some maybe small element of this film that is about, um, um, what's his name, Bong Joon-ho's perspective as somebody who's risen to fame right risen risen to like to be very wealthy and to be recognized as an auteur the character of an architect a famous architect who built his own house is what you know what more explicit example of an auteur do you want or of just like a great artist right he it's that nam gung is embarrassed by his knowledge which is kind of forbidden of what it takes to live to create a house like this maintain it he knows that he's aware of the of the the bunker underneath the basement the family that moves in everything they do is just a projection of status and i think this culminates in the symbol of the mom right she has no understanding she can't even identify the smell of the poor people who live in their house she can't identify that it's similar and her entire mission is to make da song who intuitively is trying to grasp that like her right to shelter him from the world but she doesn't even really know exactly what it is that she's doing because she hasn't seen that world she's just repeating the world that has been given to her right and the tension between her attempt to replicate that world in da song and da song's experience of the smell of the ghost and of the smell of the people it's where the what she calls the trauma of his childhood comes from right the entirety of the movie is is an act of like magic to try to continually suppress da song's trauma and and, and I, I i mean i kind of already had this reading but then when i saw the last scene again i was like fuck like it's every all of these different cur these currents these symbols get tied together in da song right like it's the thing about the the uh american indians like he and um mr kim and mr park are the indians and then like the housekeeper's husband comes out with a knife and it, it goes from like a, a complete projection of a fake situation that's a representation of a conflict between like white like white supremacist colonizing society and indigenous inhabitants but it, it's it's it gets made real but not in the sense that the um the um romantic image is stripped away right it's not that it's that the universe gives a fuck you to that to, to even the conception of the fantasy and just goes right to no here let's reassure let's reassert da song's trauma the thing that everyone is afraid of through all of this fakeness let's go right to what is basically the constitutive kernel of his personality and manifest it and just it just fucking destroys him but more than that it destroys the entire family the jig is up at the exact moment that he sees the housekeeper's husband come out and stand in front of him in the middle of on basically on the anniversary of the last time that this traumatic event happened, he has to confront something that he has no way to understand, which is all of the things that have been going on this entire time under the surface in order to make his life make sense. Thank you for listening to Depth Perception. Join us live Wednesdays at 7.30 Eastern at twitch.tv slash depthperceptionpodcast. Podcast.